Good afternoon, everyone. This is Sumitra Bojan with at and I'm in the Access Architecture team, and uh, you know, we've talked a few times about several topics um, in OLT, and um, Earl just talked about the fiber, uh, which is you know one of the big, uh, you know, uh, going from the central office to the customer. So I'm going to focus more on what do we do at the central office in order to provide service, right? Um, most people are probably familiar with a couple of the specifications uh, AT&T has out there. Uh, one is the GPON OLT spec, uh, which has been approved, and you know we have some products, as well as the XGSPON um, OLT. Um, so kind of expanding upon what we already have, um, this is sort of, I mean, this is where I would like to hear more from the audience here. I know Tom has given me a lot of time, uh, so I'm really hoping we can have more um, a, of a conversation type today, uh, like a true workshop, um, rather than me just showing some slides. Um, because, meaning we've socialized about the FPGA design, and one of the at least goal for AT&T has been that, okay, we have moved from GPON to XGSPON, and we have good products out there. You know, XGSPON is definitely, you know, the, the next generation PON that we will we are deploying. But at the same time, if you look at what's happening in these standards, you know, folks are already talking about the next generation, which is the 25 gig PON. Um, meaning, it's still you know it's yet to be seen how it goes. But I think 25 gig PON is more of, you know, um, mobility, you know, it, it's a good uh, XL use case rather than a consumer based. Um, but then we got to see how the industry moves forward. Um, so, so that was one of the driver. And so we thought, okay, let's look at something that could be future proof. Um, so we have, that's why we call it a programmable PON. So where you have the flexibility to kind of in the future, when you see more volume pick up on the 25 gig, you have an option, um, you know, to go that path instead of having to, you know, deploy new hardware and so on, right? So that's kind of the main driver. And also to get some a little bit more efficiency than what we have today with the, um, you know, the 16 port OLT. So I would say, you know, it's it's kind of both uh, together. So XGS, as you all know, it's a 10 gig symmetric service um, with 25 gig yet to be seen. Like I said, there are talks about you know 10 and 25, you know, with the 10 gig upstream, 25 down, or we could also have something like a 25 gig symmetric service. So a few things, you know, we still need to talk. Uh, let's, you know, see how the FPGA will work here, right? Um, I've had several discussions with uh, some of the FPGA silicon vendors, you know, I know Xilinx is here, Altera is here as well. Um, we've had discussions about, you know, use of FPGAs in OLTs and also, you know, with third-party, you know, IP providers, because that's one of the big challenge with IP, right? Uh, we need to have the PON IP here in order to make this work in the OCP community. Um, some of the business models we have talked about is, you know, it's very, it looks very similar to an ASIC, um, where you would have to kind of design um, an FPGA to kind of fit what you need to, to fit the requirements um, that would make it standard for any um, you know, to, to, to make it available for the OCP community and the ODMs who would want to build these type of um, white box. Um, like I said, it just gives the option to customize. Um, so, meaning right here, I think we can pause and kind of, I would like to hear if there are any feedback on, you know, do you really see a value in um, having a 25 gig, a, a 10 gig to a 25 gig path um, in one of these designs? So. I know there are a few operators out there, so if you, you know, if you would like to say something, um, you know, feel free to comment. Because we're really, meaning at this point, you know, we're kind of throwing the idea out there and saying, you know, how much interest do we have in the community um, for a product like this? Uh, because at the end of the day, you do need the volume uh, to be successful, right? So. 
you know, maybe it would be good to provide, to my mind, the kind of way to frame that question is really around this. You can, you can have an XGS pawn box today, and let's say it has a cost factor of one. And in future, you might need a 25 gig pawn, and you have two different paths that you might get to the future. You can say in future, I'll buy a new 25G box, and it'll have a cost factor of 1.2, right? Or something, <laughs> I'm making it up. But is there value in being able to buy a box today that might have a beefier FPGA, let's say, and can do, um, and it maybe have a cost factor in between somewhere, where you don't buy the new box, you can actually convert some ports to 25 gig or all ports to 25 gig in, in a future mode without changing boxes. Is there value in that, or is it better just to have two separate boxes? What, what do carriers think? Or what does anybody think for that matter? Thank you, Tom. I'm sorry. I no, that was, you, you framed it better. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, go ahead, please. Right, and once again, I think you, you'll do a balancing act. The, the most natural thing to do probably would to be to derate the number of active ports. So I get 16 ports at 10 gig, and I get eight ports at 25 gig, or some right. some kind of juggling like that, right? <laughs> right. Right, I mean, you're, you're not going to say, get the same cost per port, but it would mm -hmm. definitely be different. Um, Right, that's the big thing, right? I Meaning you don't have to, you know, go and replace everything, right? Uh, though you may not get the same ports, but you, you're going to at least, you know, extend the, li the lifetime of the equipment. That is true, yeah. That's a good feedback, thank you. And I think that also brings up another question of optics, right? You know, how do you, um, if you're looking at the same box, you would have to at least, you know, design it to future-proof for the 25 gig, and you kind of have to work at least with the MSA at this point, what goes in the OLT. Um, so that's, you know, that's another probably a discussion that we would need to have. Um, I know, meaning I'm, I'm not an optics person, so I meaning I do know, I think in the 25 gig, they've been looking at um, like an SFP 28, um, I believe, which would work with like an SFP plus uh, type of cage. Um, so I'm not sure on the path for XFP, so that's probably something that we would need to evaluate and see what is, you know, what is the best uh, option here. If uh, no other question, maybe we can probably move to a little bit more on the box itself. Um, I mean, again, we have, um, I think there's going to be another talk after mine on, in general, about the CG open rack design. And I mean, you know, there is the, you know, in the telco, um, OCP telco, we do have the CG open rack 19 with the sled designs for compute and storage. You know, I think they have the half and the full sled. And we've been deploying mostly the 19-inch 1RU type OLT. Again, the question again here is, you know, is there a value in looking at the open sled model? Um, do we go down the path of, you know, um, make use of, you know, that's something, you know, you've already designed, right? Um, can we make use of some of the um, uh, efficiency that's out there in the sled for an OLT? Uh, 
to me, one thing that comes to mind is maybe, you know, cost efficiency, power, you know, those things we could benefit um, by, you know, in having those, uh, you know, moving to, to a CG19 type of um, design. Um, so. Sure. Yeah. So, do do you see? Meaning, I know we have the 19-inch OLT, right? So, do you see a path to kind of convert that into a CG19 uh, to fit into a CG19 rack? So is the, I mean I'm just trying to understand. So is that more of the uplink that I would need to mm -hmm. um, connect up to that, probably right? Okay. So you would still an uplink probably. Right. Okay. So you you could still have um, so all of the customer facing on the front panel, yeah. like you. Said. Okay. Okay. That's I think. So that can actually, you know, kind of give me more room on the front plate too, you know, to increase ports if needed. Okay. Okay. Well, if, if, you, if you take the, that, uh, you know, appliance design, you take the power supply out and just have a DC interface, the bus bar, and then you use your uplink to the embedded or uh, embedded four port connector. So, one of the things I, or I think about in this space is that um, if you have, if you have the, the standard, the left side of the picture here, the standard 19-inch 1RU, then your addressable market is bigger, right? That, that yeah. people who haven't bought into CG Rack 19 can make use of the box. So, to me, there's this kind of balancing act. and. We thought about um, taking sort of the interior design and saying that in a 19, 19 inch wide 1RU uh, box inside, I won't have one card, sort of one motherboard, but rather I'd have two, two modules, right? And in fact, they might line up well with an FPGA on each. 
And then the question then becomes, well, if I look at the sled design, is it, would it be just that simple that I could take those two and stack them now instead of putting them side to side? And is that still adding, the question in my mind is, it, does it add sufficient expense to create the different physical form factor around those motherboards that it, it's fragmenting the market or you know, creating something that has very small numbers? It's really my biggest worry about, I, I, I see this sort of draw to go to the rack scale architecture, to pull the power supplies out, to have the blind connecting in the back, but how do you get that rolling, right? That, and maybe we could come back to this when you guys talk about the open rack this afternoon, but it's sort of the, for me, one of the biggest questions, and I don't, you know, don't have the answer. It was really kind of the thing that I was hoping a workshop discussion might <laughs> might come up. You know, if lots of carriers said, well, we don't do that now, but we see value in, in rack scale architectures and we want to go there in the future, then you can strike out in that direction and, and try to do something. I have a nineteen seventy five Honda. <laughs> <laughs> So I think it's a good lead into your talk, right? <laughs> but I guess you're you're talking about well, it's having a bigger market and so on and so forth. But mm -hmm. at some point, you know, you just have to say it's it's an old design and let's just throw it out and start fresh and you know, rather than continue to band aid it. I, I mean I think that um, you know, there's not band aid, it's just an old you know, nineteen eighty three design. Well so would you say Yeah. <laughs> oh. Folks that aren't going to make the 
They're still there, but they have RIP on them, right? <laughs> So, so I guess ma maybe I can reel it in a little bit. I was gonna, I was gonna try to throw, throw two things out to, to some menu. Okay. It's still on the same topic. I wasn't gonna change topics. I was. Okay. No, not a bit. think so. I think that the compute compute has um, an assumption that it won't be the single point of failure, but that it it is not sort of the single tail from the customer's uh, facility. Whereas on a PON device, there's not an there's not an easy way, not a cheap way anyway, to fail over the PON ODN from this PON box to that PON box. But but as far as like temperature and safety, that's all going to be fairly similar. Mm -hmm. What requirement does the compute equipment now have? Does it inherit the pond requirement? No, not so much. So the compute still has to be safe for CO. It has to have the basic environmental capabilities. But um, our assumption would be that there won't be a customer that's permanently physically attached to that computer. And if something hardware or software messes up on that one, the one right next to it can take over for it. Is that making sense? Okay. Yeah, we're back on pawn again. <laughs> Don't you know? So, yeah, I was, I was gonna reel it in and then toss something that way, maybe to Jeff and Jeff, since <laughs> we've got, <laughs> We got manufacturers here, and I'd like to get just sort of a, you know a, a finger in the wind on um, would it be is there um, what would I call it is there manufacturing efficiency if we if we had a design that had let's say motherboard layouts that could be side by side or above and below 
to cater for, let's say, both models. And so I won't get beat up by Bill over here because I, <laughs> I'm sticking with a 19-inch thing, but we can sell to carriers who haven't seen the light yet for, for rack scale architectures. Is that is that feasible? Is that like, you know, I'm sorry, but that's twice as much work. I might as well just make two complete boxes from scratch. So you actually fell in my trap because <laughs> <laughs> because the open sled environment is really based on a single sled type platform that's reusable for different types of sheet metal systems that we would deliver. So the original design of the open sled came from our Axera system that is a two U, four U, six U. One new type of appliance that can also be modified, not by changing the board layouts, but where they're placed in the sled and then the power requirements that goes into those sleds. So what I was going to try to say is, is that sure, if all the internal components that would go into a OCP carrier grade sled can also fit into a standalone appliance. All the internal aspects would be the same, whether you're stacking it or side by side. Mm -hmm. And what we did. <coughs> about the other Jeff. higher the 
density, the better, but too high also means it's bigger thermal energy on it, right? right. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important data on that. If we are going to go with two architectures, we need to make sure the components are, are designed correctly for that. So you're saying that basically the building blocks would be the same, whether you put it in a 19 or a, right? Be, try and mm -hmm. maximize. Right, I think we're getting yeah a little bit more into the physical design, right? Meaning, right. will it really fit into that model? Um, so I think it might be worthwhile just saying something that I don't know everyone has caught on with is that the the box to the left is sort of one rack unit and 19 inch wide, and the sled we see as two rack units and half that size. So the front face plate has the same square inch area, right? And that's why I came up with this, you know, off the wall thing that you might have two cards that are either side by side or top and bottom. And it, at least to me, it sounded like a fairly straightforward kind of, th kind of thing. Yep, I did. Those, you were correct. <laughs> yeah, so, so those, those decisions need to be articulated and said, right. this is the decision that this group has made. Because you could say the, the thing on the left has three cards. You could, so you could. absolutely. And, and, and then that gets you into a completely different structure where you could have a three dog thing in that little box. And maybe someone who uses does, right? <laughs> right, yeah. Is there ever a need for two RAs or 48 ports? You mean all the way across? Yeah, and when during deployment, do you only deploy one of these boxes in a rack, or do you deploy multiple boxes? There's worry about how big a crater you'll make if a box goes out. And so it, I, don't think we're, I don't think we're hitting it yet, right? But... Uh, um, for example, in the G-PON design, it was a 48-PON box. I don't think there was a lot of a desire to double that and create a 2RU 96-port G-PON box. Not that you couldn't. You could have, right? But I think somewhere, somewhere around 50 ports or so um, is probably going to be the upper limit that people want to worry about. But but if you look at uh, maybe a, uh, an XGS, do you think that would still be a, a good model, or do you think that's a great point? You with know, with if a you, you have more volume, right? If you think about the application for 10 gig in in the for uh, upcoming 25 gig pond, these are likely to be higher end, you know, cell site type of connectivity, and a lot of times the carriers go super conservative in that, right? There's some some carriers who don't mingle consumer and business on the same pond um, <laughs> wouldn't know any of those, right? <laughs> but yeah, so it could be the case that this one rack unit high is all that's ever going to be needed. So maybe I have a, maybe that's another question for Jeff, and that is, if we had, um, say, we came up with a design that was a 19-inch unit, and it was one that 
could be put into a, a kind of sled, not half and half, but a sled that maybe took two of them and ganged them up and put them in, or, or even just one. Could you take a 19, and you know, you lose the switch mode power supplies, you create some kind of, I don't know what you'd call it, little interface module in the back to, con to interwork the power and interwork the, some connectors with, I don't know how the connectors would work, but. Right. And you put your existing product in, in the sheet metal, <coughs> and then you know, did the right power module, and then you draw power on the, the bus bar in the back. I can envision this. You could make a, a double-wide um, unit going to be 19. Then you could have a sled. Now, the sled in that situation uh, may need a new piece of sheet metal, but I think a common PCB that would be out there Okay. You think it'd be two RU? So you, you mean like the two RU full wide or? Yeah, full width. Okay. Good feedback. I, th I think we can probably ready to move on. Um, Um, I don't think the one, I don't know, what? is one U critical? You mean the 19 inch? Uh, I or think the, the height. Oh, the uh, height? Yeah. I don't mean, I think we should be open to, to you too. Yeah. yeah. I think I was more debating like 2UF would provide pretty much the same port, right, as a 1RU. Uh, when you do full wide, you get double the density, of course. Yep, there's a little concern that comes in there, but uh, there's typically not density problems in most COs, right? <laughs> I think that's one thing maybe I can, we can go back and see, you know, what is our optimal, you know, uh, port count as well. Um, and if other operators have any input, you know, feel free to reach out to me as well. So like I said, you know, we've kind of, you know, like uh, been partnering with several of them and uh, most notably recently with Xilinx and Fennec. Um, we kind of touched upon, you know, what is the, again, the optimal module, right? If you want to build like, uh, like a building block of FPGAs, yeah, I think this is another conversation we should have. Whether eight ports make sense or do we move to 12 ports? Um, those are some of the decisions we will have to make. Uh, depending on the, I guess, the form factor now, uh, the desired form factor. Um, I think we kind of touched upon all of these. Um, one other area, I know with GPON, um, Tom, you had the, um, without the aggregation, right? And with the XGS OLT, we brought in the aggregation back into the box. Um, so that's another topic, you know, we could discuss on whether it's desirable to have some kind of a local aggregation inside the OLT. I mean, I think there are, I guess, several models you could do. Um, there are thoughts about having a BNG function in the OLT. That's one use case. Or do we want to move this aggregation out of the OLT box and then make it more of a, you know, like a top of rack, uh, where you could also have, you know, host a BNG and aggregation and keep this very simple. Um, just do the pawn Mac. Um, 
Again, cost and, you know, I think these type of things would probably matter more here. Uh, if you have local aggregation and especially uh, BNG at the top of rack. Um, I mean, we could also do a design that you could have a module, like an optional module. If operators desire, uh, you can put that in. You know, that's one way to do it, um, just like how we did the optional CPU. Um, I don't know if there are any, um, you know, uh, pros and cons with uh, this type of uh, a design. You're saying with the 25 gig, right, or? So you basically, you have your density, right, with the 25 mm -hmm. gig, right? At the expense of being oversubscribed. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, this is usually a topic that gets carriers really, when I've spoken to other carriers about it, they get animated about the, it's like tastes great, less filling. Some people really want the aggregation in the box. Other people really don't like the aggregation in the box. and. Um, it's amazing, <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, it'd be good to get, I think it's one of those things that you, I hate to think it's going to remain sort of bifurcated going forward, but um, it might. It's, um, it's interesting. <laughs> so does it, in, in that case, Tom, is, is aggregation occur in the building if it's not in the box? Yes. Right. So the, the original AT&T G-PON design was kind of like a transceiver shelf. Each, each Phi chip um, had its own uplink and there was no aggregation in the box. If you, you couldn't, if you lit up all of the Phi's, you had to light up all the uplinks, which is good and bad because there's no aggregation in the box that's cheap. Most top of rack boxes are like the cheapest switching on the planet. Let's just face it, right? Um, on the other hand, if you put aggregation in the box, you've moved that chip from the top of the rack into the box now, and but you get to then only use a, a smaller number of uplinks. So on a, oops, it went away. On the XGS PON design, those 600 gig links, you might only have one of them lit up, and it might not even be at 100 gig, right? So. I mean, I think it, it is tastes great less filling. If yeah. you're if you're going to be putting things into a building, I think that the aggregation less design is actually cheaper overall as an architecture, and it allows the carrier to design sort of by build out the amount of oversubscription inherent in the whole system. On the other hand, there's a lot of carriers who say I want like one box out in a street cabinet or one of those cabinets that Earl comes up with and then you don't want to have you know four or six back backhaul links back to a central office when one would have done the job out you know in, a, in an ag in design Start getting really picky because 
Right. You have 24, 48 links, basically. Or you, you can do some L2 aggregation or other very simple aggregation where it emulates a point to point link. But right. You're going over a back, uh, back end fiber uh, or back end up, up link, right? I think the, the second thing you said is what's more prevalent in the industry. If I, if I look at the um, merchant silicon for PON systems, with a few exceptions, most of them have more phis and then a, a fairly aggregated uplink. Like in the in the GPON spec, there were 10 gig phi, 10 gig uplinks and four phis per chip. And then the same with the um, XGS PON, there's two phis per chip. And so I think that that level of aggregation is fine, especially if it's not oversubscribed and you don't have to do the TM as you were asking earlier. And that, then that turns into a simple, a simple design to build and a simple way to think about it because there's not going to be, um, it's not going to be something that some network engineer needs to design between the ag switch and the and the phi or transceiver shelf. Okay, um, I, mean, I think we kind of touched upon a little bit on the optics. Um, that's again, you know, I guess more discussions to be had um, in that area as well. Um, but kind of, and I think in, for the rest of the design, we'll pretty much follow what we already have done, you know, with an optional CPU, as well as, you know, support the BMC as well. Um, so this is like a high level block diagram, not, nothing set in stone, you know, we'll still need to like, you know, we discussed about eight ports, 12 ports. So those discussions will need to happen and before we can kind of say, you know, this is the, you know, the building block, right? So each of that could be, you can view it as a building block um, with fixed number of ports. Um, so that would be the ideal design. Um, right now I'm just showing like an eight port. Um, you know, we can look at definitely like a 12 port, an FPGA module as well, um, that can fit well into like a 19 inch or a, a sled model. Um, so these show like dedicated uplinks if you don't have the aggregation. Um, if you do, then you know, you can kind of oversubscribe there. So that's kind of where we are. Um, I mean, I think in the, probably in the next couple months, um, it would be really good to hear some feedback and move this design to where we really need it to go, um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, number of ports, um, as well as, you know, the rack design as well. So I encourage ODMs, you know, if you are, you know, thinking about it, please, you know, let me know, and it would be good to get uh, get an idea on in the layout, the mecha the physical um, layout, as well as we talk about uh, not just the you know board level information, right? I think it all kind of goes together because uh, one of the key thing that I've noticed is you know you don't want to kind of build a spec and then end up having to build it and it cost me a lot, right? So kind of want to work it a little bit backward and say, you know, how do I build an efficient um, design um, right from the beginning? So it is cost effective, power effective, um, and, you know, that way, you know, we can take it to the market quickly um, and don't want to, like, deal with things like later on and how do I um, make it more efficient. So that's kind of, you know, where we are. Um, so I guess we'll have to look at cost, design, um, and the efficient model before we start building a box. So at least that's kind of the goal here. So uh, just another question. Uh, PON requires, you know, memory on, on the board before you use them. What is the cost that uh, uh, the room or, uh, you know, could do the broader product have in terms of longevity of the product? Because you, you see DRAM. That's a great question. <laughs> There's what I w wish the answer were and what I think the answer is, right? <laughs> that should be the answer right there. I'm, I'm guessing we'd have to use parts that have 
um, availability over a longer term than PC type memory type parts, right? And so, um, yeah, that's how it is, right? I'd expect that uh, once these once these boxes go into service, um, the good news is that at the access, every so often there need, there's a need for an upgrade. So it isn't in place as long as some TDM gear has been, but even even so, a uh, life cycle for one of these things is, oh gosh, what could it be? Could be 10 years at least, so. Right, you want to <laughs> extend the launch. <laughs> well, I don't think we're trying to elongate the longevity with 25. I think what we find is that there's a, near-term need for higher bandwidth access for some, well, let's say for cell sites and for, for businesses that uh, the PON to two and a half gig doesn't address and 10 gig is kind of still iffy. I mean, if I think of a 5G small cell, um, I might think about bringing 10 gig to something like that. And I don't want to use PON as a point-to-point -point network. So I really need a little more in my PON system if I'm going to use that as a distribution to multiple small cells. Bob, how many, how many down, uh, down ports would there be in a, at a installation? When you say down ports? Well, let's say pawn ports. Would there be, is, it, is it dozens or is it hundreds? Hundreds. I mean, it varies. There will be some locations that have only a few, like dozens. There will be other locations that will have several hundred and everything in between. Right. Any other feedback? Uh, I think that's kind of my last mm -hmm. slide and um, just in general, wanted to kind of share the architecture. Uh, today, in the, in the morning, we you know heard about the cord um, architecture and it's similar, this is you know, you can call it one of uh, the reference design for AT&T in how we make use of the OCP white box. Um, so what you see in the bottom, uh, the gray box is the OCP white box. Uh, the OLT in, in the next topic, you know, will be I'll be covering the GFAST as well. It could be one of those. And all you see in the green is the ONF, so the disaggregated software there um, that is the control and all of the V-axis application. Um, and then you know, and then be able to orchestrate via on app and uh, we have um, actually you know I think today was when we actually got kind of the approval in on app for this use case uh, to be included as part of the next release which is Casablanca so it's called the awesome um, open source access manager so we will be able to kind of demonstrate or kind of showcase how on app uh, will be able to, at least at a high level, uh, to begin with, you know, be able to monitor these, um, if you, you know, call these as like pods that go in a central office, you know, how you can use own app to configure and um, have some high level view into the several uh, thousand central offices. So that's the idea to begin with. Um, so, so that work is underway with the Linux Foundation. Um, so th these are all like you know, how we kind of take um, the different um, software components and hardware in as part of the Linux Foundation and how we bridge it together to form a, a reference architecture. Uh, kind of gives a view of that. That's, that's kind of my end and like I said, you know, call for action would be, you know, I would like to collaborate more and get this spec out, you know, in the next few months, um, so. Feedback is encouraged, as well as in our ODMs. Um, I would like to hear from you all as well. Okay. Thank you. Well, I have this.